Welcome to CGF 2017. CGF Forumuna hoş geldiniz. Bienvenidos al CGF 2017. Добро пожаловать на форум CGF 2017. Bienvenue au CGF 2017. Herzlich willkommen zu CGF Forum. Bienvenidos al CGF 2017. We live in challenging times. It's a crucial moment when we humans need to stand for the good. Мы живем в трудные времена. Это решающий момент, когда мы, люди, должны стоять на благо. Innovation for social purposes, ethics and transparency are the keys to building a better world for, world for the next generations. But we can't do it alone. We need to join forces, voices, hearts. Инновации в социальных сетях, этика и прозрачность являются ключом к созданию лучшего мира для следующих поколений. Но мы не можем сделать это в одиночку. Нам нужно объединить силы, голоса, сердца. Today we are connecting for good, and we are proud to do it here in Astana during the Expo 2017, a most important event in Central Asia. Oriu, the social network for social good, is happy to host the fourth edition of Social Innovation and Global Ethics Forum at a turning point in our history with all the challenges that it carries. Сегодня мы садимся навсегда. Мы гордимся, что где мы делаем это здесь, в Астане, столице Республики Казахстан. Во время проведения международной выставки Экспо 2017, важнейшее событие в Центральной Азии и важнейшее событие во всем мире. Хорию, социальная сеть социального облака. С радостью примет четвертое заседание форума социальных инноваций и глобальной этики на проблемном этапе нашей истории со всеми вытекающими из этого проблемами. As we are speaking now, we are globally connected with 180 countries and live streaming to a network of more than 250,000 people. Как вы знаете, мы глобально связаны со 180 странами и транслируем сеть более 250 тысяч человек. This forum is an agora for change makers from all over the planet to celebrate the diversity of cultures, knowledge and inspirations. But CGF also celebrates unity. We are all here for a common goal to shape better times to come. Этот форум предназначен для всех стран с нашей планеты, чтобы отметить разнообразие культур, знаний и вдохновения. Но CGF также отмечает единство. Мы все здесь для достижения общей цели. Last year, CGF took place in Marrakesh, Morocco, during the United Nations Conference of the Parties for Climate Change, COP22. We engaged in a collective call to action and helped to carry the message that, as a global society, we need to come up with urgent solutions to leave a fair legacy for the next generations. В прошлом году Сига проходил в Маракеше, Марокко, во время конференции сторон Организации Объединенных Наций по изменению климата. Мы участвовали в коллективном призыве к действию и помогли донести сообщение о том, что в качестве глобального общества нам необходимо придумать неотложные решения, оставить справедливое наследие для следующего поколения. Today we are taking one step further. CGF 17 is bringing speakers who will present some of the latest, latest innovations in three of the most challenges, challenging issues of our times. To all of us, smart cities, future energy, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It will showcase various experiences and projects and debate sustainable solutions to shape better times to come. Сегодня мы сделаем еще один шаг вперед. CGF 2017 предоставляет докладчикам, которые представят некоторые из последних нововведений в трех из самых сложных вопросов нашего времени для всех нас. Умных городов, будущей энергии и цели ООН в области устойчивого развития. Они продемонстрируют нам различные опыты и проекты и обсудят устойчивые решения. Мы благодарны нашим партнерам, United Nations Development Program, China World Peace Foundation, USA Pavilion, Swiss Pavilion, Angola Pavilion, UAE Pavilion, UK Pavilion, Ghana Pavilion, Sustainable Development Goals Center Africa, International Chamber of Commerce Hong Kong, EBPA, and our dear friends at Rixos President Astana Hotel. Мы благодарны нашим партнерам, программы развития Организации Объединенных Наций, Pro ООН, Всемирным фондом мира Китая, Павильоном США, Швейцарии, Анголы, Павильоном Объединенных Арабских Эмиратов, Павильоном Великобритании, Ганы, 
центром целей устойчивого развития в Африке, международной торговой платой НК, Евро, и нашим дорогим гостям, друзьям, Риксас, Хотел, Астана. We would like to thank our media partners that are spreading our CGF good news worldwide, Smart City News, European Youth Awards, Alliance Magazine and Ethical Markets. Мы хотели поблагодарить наших медиа партнеров, которые распространяют наши хорошие новости CGF по всему миру. Новости Smart City, европейские молодежные награды, журнал Alliance и этические рынки. At this stage, allow me to invite Jonathan Parenti founder and CEO of ORU, to share his opening remarks with you. На этом этапе позвольте мне пригласить Йоната Париенти, основателя, основателя и генерального директора ХОРЮ. Please join me on welcoming Jonathan. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, dear friends, thank you very much for being here. The beauty of today is we are in Central Asia. Last year, we were in Marrakesh during the United Nations Conference for the Climate. And today, the specificity of uh, that gathering is not only we have, you know, like more than 50 nationalities represented, you know, among that conference for the full day, but as well, we are connected in 180 countries in live stream. So for some of the people listening, you know, to the conference now, uh, it's very early in the morning, so all of you, you know, like bienvenidos to CGF 2017. Now, why are we doing that conference every year? When we decided to launch OU and to create a new way to connect one to the other, to build up inspiration, to build up, you know, like the awareness on solutions that can, you know, like bring more sustainability, more balance and harmony in people's life, we wanted, you know, like to know one thing. It's the people that matter. And those people have the solutions. They are from their local grounds, with their traditions, with their culture, with their diversities. And from that, they can, you know, find the best way to address the challenges that we are facing. So all you in its social network, it's to enable to connect those people one to the other so they can share the solutions of tomorrow. But at the same time, we cannot stay only, you know, being, you know, like in the virtual world. So technology has to serve that connectivity, but it's not enough. What is important as well is us to meet real life in persons. When we are meeting in persons, it's no longer just words on an email. It's no longer like just a Skype or a distance connections. It's about sharing energy, sharing empathy, being able, you know, like to speak one to the other, but in the best way to want to discover the other and to build true relationships, one for the other. So CGF 2017 in Astana, Kazakhstan, is, you know, like for us, a way to express our support for the subject that has been decided for the Expo, future energy. We are living in a world where Consumption is at all levels, you know, knocking at the doors of everyone. We are consuming, you know, from the morning to the end of the day. But what matters is what is our responsibility and how can we make that consumption into a marketing society, marketing-driven society, more sustainable. And to find those solutions, we need to meet one to the other, to understand that what we have in overconsumption in one way is not necessarily, you know, like available in some other part of the world. That in for some other part of the world, some needs can have, you know, the benefit from the technology that has been developed in some other countries. So when we build up synergies, when we build up, you know, like understanding and learning one from the other, then we can find more harmonious solutions. So during those three, you know, like plenary sessions we're going to have, we're going to learn about smart cities. How can cities connect one to the other, facilitate a more sustainable way? As well as we're going to learn about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. How can it serve as an opportunity for the future to build up a more harmonious world? And finally, we will speak about future energy. How can we, at this moment, we can make the decisions and choices 
that will impact people in the future and future generation so we can still live on earth in a way which is you know like decent for everyone so ladies and gentlemen your excellencies it's a great pleasure to say and with all of you like CJF is open now and yes for shaping again better times to come now enable me you know like to give the floor again to our dear friends so we can call a great friend from China that has made you know like a stand and advocacy for global peace in China and beyond Dr. Li Ruong please Please welcome Dr. Li Wu Hong, Chairman of China World Peace Foundation, Founder of Peace Garden, and Director General of Beijing International Peace Culture Foundation. Приветствуйте доктора Ли Джу Она, представителя Всемирного фонда мира в Китае, основателя Всемирного сада и генерального директора Международного форума мира в Пекине.尊敬的大会主办方尊敬的外交使节们尊敬的各位朋友们感谢大会主办机构十分荣幸能参加这次大会也十分高兴能与各位朋友们交流上周我在乌兹别克斯坦参加政府举办的中亚复兴文明大会
，只要资源配置合理、伦理相通、符合民生愿望，将文化底蕴与智慧城市结合。在国际合作中，区域优势会进入到快车道。“一带一路”开辟了世界最长的经济走廊，它的核心是民心相通，需要爱心与利益的平衡。有了感情，就有了行动。我们知道，中亚是多民族、多文化并存的地区，具有很强的文化包容性。希望各国青年们和中亚青年一代。更多了解历史，更多的认知对方，在更多的多边合作中分享发展成果。如何在社会资源、自然资源、金融资源和人工智能的结合中找到共同点，转化为给世界的礼物？女士们、先生们、朋友们，在阿拉木图有一条险心海大道。一九四一年，卫国战争爆发，中国著名作曲家冼星海在举目无亲、贫困交加之际，哈萨克斯坦音乐家拜卡达摩夫接待了他，为他提供了一个温暖的家。在阿拉木图，冼星海创造了《民族解放》《神圣之战》《满江红》等著名的音乐作品，并根据哈萨克斯坦民族英雄阿曼。盖尔德的事迹，创造出交响乐《阿曼盖尔德》，激励人们为抗击法西斯而战，受到了当地人民的广泛欢迎。哈斯克斯坦有句谚语：“力量不在胳膊上，而在团结上。”相信在和平加一的路径中，我们所影响的国家和各界合合作伙伴们，会为中亚的和平与发展。为人类的幸福做出应有的贡献，谢谢。Thank you, Dr. Lee.、Um, Technology and connectivity have been auspicious to cities all over the world. They support policies in varied areas like urban planning, construction, security, water management, and transportation. Thanks to the most recent developments, we can dream about a more efficient, inclusive, and sustainable future. We would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Nicholas Yu. Co-president of Global Cities Business Alliance, former UN Habitat advisor. Hello, it's not me, Nicolas. You, we we are connecting with Nicolas. He is in Kenya right now at the moment. So we will just ask, you know, like for、uh, five minutes, you know, like pause. And then we would, you know, like start with Nicolas or with the panel. Thank you very much.
So let's start the panel while we wait for Mr. Nicholas, you. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Andrew Snow White, Executive Director of USA Pavilion, Astana Expo 2017. Pierre-Olivier Boyer, Director of Strategic, Strategic Partnerships of VCAT Group. <laughs> Professor Ali Ayoub, RU Advisor, Strategic Communication, Public Policy, Communication and Corporate Law. <laughs> and we will also be joined by Mr. Nicholas Yu in a few moments. Um, Okay. So um, we would like to invite our yeah, please just come closer. Yeah. We would like to invite our panelists to share their thoughts about the role of technology in making our cities better for people. So maybe sharing the example of their cities or telling us about a case they worked or experienced. So, Andrew, thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for having me here today. Um, I think cities and urbanization and, and uh, smart cities are a key to a positive future around the world. Um, the number that always sticks out in my head when we talk about smart cities, you know, the estimates in the next 35 years are that we're going to have 2 billion people moving from uh, rural areas into urban areas. 2 billion people. Um, so that would be equivalent of, of about needing one new London every month and a half. And not just needing a new London in terms of planning it, but planning it, building it, populating it, having jobs and so forth. So um, what we have in front of us is, is pretty daunting. So um, they asked me to put a few slides together about why I'm here, who I am, and, and some of my experience. So I'll run through those really quickly. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm here in Astana this summer uh, as the executive director of the US Pavilion. So um, this is my, my second expo. And I really enjoy these global events because it's one of the few times where you can bring a real network of global citizens together around a specific theme, um, but also to talk about, uh, you know, solutions. And for me, you know, that's, that's what I always like to focus on. I know there's always doom and gloom in the world, but um, solutions are, are, are the things that, that I think we all have in common. So. Um, uh, if you show the next slide, is, a, 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 is a, a clip from our main show. So we took a little bit of a, um, of a, oh, great, thanks. I, I'd say, you know, we interpreted the theme of future energy, I think, a little differently than a lot of the other pavilions did. Um, for us, we knew that uh, the audience that was going to be here was going to be very much a family audience, um, not super technical. and. Um, we, we focus a lot on the energy of people. I think that's something that, as Americans, we feel um, is kind of a core part of our DNA, is, is this kind of spirit of innovation and, and hope and partnership. Um, so this is a shot from our, of our main show, which um, has really been well received um, with, our, uh, with our guests. All right, let me see if I can get this the right way. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through these quickly. This is, a, this is a picture from the last expo I did, which was in uh, Yosu, South Korea in 2012. This is a, a shot of our, um, of our, of our pre-show. And uh, the theme of that expo was a living ocean coast, which um, is really the piece of the world that inspired me to get into environment sustainability and, and urbanization. Um, it started when I was a kid and it's been something that's been with me um, throughout my life. So when we did Yosu, it was this really wonderful uh, opportunity to combine the um, kind of ocean education work that I'd done in the past along with uh, the work I've been doing about 
the last 10 years around how do you tell an environmental story through the built space. So here's just a little background. Um, that woman in the top left is a woman named uh, Eugenie Clark. She was known as the Shark Lady. Uh, she was one of the pioneering uh, female scientists of the 20th century. And um, she really was a catalyst for me in terms of moving beyond awareness to action. And I think that when we talk about uh, a sustainability environment, and, and this goes into to cities as well, um, we can make people aware as much as uh, all day long, but getting them out into the field or getting them out into a place um, and taking action is really what, what spurs, I think, people to, to be passionate. So um, that led me to, in the bottom right corner, uh, uh, one of my oldest and dearest friends, Philippe Cousteau, Jr., um, who has been my business partner for, for a number of years. Um, so that, that was a big part of my ocean piece of all of this. And, and I mention all of this because I think it's important, especially when I talk to young people, about finding what your passion is. And, and when I talk about urbanization and when I talk about cities, for me, this, it goes back to the oceans because, um, you know, this, the environment does pretty well on its own. Sustainability, though, is about people, and it's about how people interact with the world. So that passion for me has gotten me to, you know, that's a shot of me taking a picture with Great White Shark and a picture I took in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. It, it's allowed me this opportunity to kind of see the world, but that informs how I look at cities. So before I... Uh, joined the USA Pavilion Project. Uh, for a number of years, I worked for a real estate development company called Gale International out of New York City. And Gale International uh, is the master developer of Songdo International Business District in South Korea, which um, I think arguably is probably the furthest along of the, of the new smart cities. Um, I can give all sorts of examples about this. I'll just talk about it quickly now. But in 2001, um, the, the government of Korea and the city of Incheon were looking for an international development partner to help build a new city with the idea being that it would be a catalyst of uh, one, bringing in foreign direct investment, but two, also helping to maintain and retain uh, kind of the brain trust within Korea that at, at a certain time had been, you know, going, going to university, studying, and then leaving. Um, so this is what it looked like. Uh, in 2001, land, land reclamation was, um, w was underway. This is about uh, 25 minutes from Incheon International Airport. This is what it looked, looked like in 2014. It's even more built up now. Um, so it's, it's a really amazing example of a city that if it's planned correctly and you have the right mix of uh, public sector and private sector partners, you can um, accomplish something pretty magnificent. <clears throat> so just for a, a little background on the city, and again, as, as we go through this discussion, I'm more than happy to give some more um, feedback on it, but uh, the International Business District is about 1,500 acres within a larger 15,000-acre uh, development. <clears throat> when it's all said and done, there'll be hundreds of thousands of people living there. Uh, even within our, uh, our footprint now, um, there's almost 50,000 residents and another 100,000 um, in the larger area. It's, uh, when, it's, when it's finished, it's going to be about 100 million square feet, which is 10 million plus square meters. Um, about two-thirds of it have already been completed. It's uh, not only uh, one of the most connected uh, cities on the planet, it's also arguably the greenest city uh, on the planet. Um, it's got uh, over 20, about 25 million square feet of LEED certified um, space. That includes the first... Uh, uh, green uh, convention center in Asia, uh, the first um, green uh, school, uh, green uh, golf course, um, clubhouse. So it, it was planned in a manner that um, was focused on how do you activate a space in a very short period of time. Um, so again, it's very smart. There's all sorts of uh, ICT um, connected throughout the uh, city. This is part of the um, hub that the city uh, uses to to look at things like traffic safety, um, monitoring, monitoring health, um, crime, and so forth. Um, so there's that piece on the on the citywide infrastructure. Um, there's all sorts of smart technologies in terms of um, energy, um, transportation, and uh, also within the residences themselves. There's a whole network that uh, we worked on with with Cisco. This is really Cisco's first smart city project. Um, and then, as I mentioned, 
Um, sustainability is a, a huge point as well. So here's the, the first sustainable, uh, or the first thing certified uh, convention center. Behind it is uh, one of the first certified towers in Korea, and then also the first certified um, hotel in Korea. So, so it's been a really great example of how smart and sustainable uh, work together. And in my mind, you can't have smart without having sustainable. Um, and then we were really excited to announce uh, something I'd worked on for quite some time um, with the city of Incheon and with our friends at the U.S. Green Building Council that uh, Songdo International Business District was the first city to, to register for Lead for Cities, which is part of the U.S. Green Building Council's new ARC platform. So actually looking uh, beyond even a district level, but at an actual city level um, to certify and to monitor um, a city. So again, I, I just wanted to, this is something that I am passionate about. It's, it's a project specifically that I worked on, and we look to replicate this um, in other areas of the world. But I think it's, it's a great example, if not the best example, of um, in a very short period of time with the right mix of, of passion and partners, you can, you can create something pretty special. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Pierre, would you please share your experience with us? Yes. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, with you today. Um, I'm here, I represent the Vika group. Uh, maybe first uh, some words about uh, our group. We are a French cement company. Um, we are in um, 11 countries. Uh, and uh, among these countries, uh, Kazakhstan. So that's why we are a partner of the Expo uh, 2017. We are uh, on the French pavilion. When, if you visit uh, us, you, you will discover our new technologies uh, based on the concrete. Um, Vika Group has a nice history because um, Louis Vika was a French scientist and engineer, and he discovered the artificial cement in uh, 1817. So it makes uh, this year two centuries of history. Uh, but Louis Vika was only a scientist, and uh, it was uh, his son, Joseph, who, who founded our company. Uh, of course, uh, as a company, we are interested uh, in the market of smart cities, but uh, the question for us is not only a question of technologies. I think the first thing is to share the problems of the cities of the future. Um, and these problems, to know them, to understand them, we have to, to organize some events like uh, today to share what are the problems and what, can, what kind of solutions we can, uh, we can find to solve them. So that's why I'm very happy to be uh, with you today. Uh, maybe some example of uh, new technologies because I know as a cement industry we, we are a member of the old economy, but uh, you will see we, we are making um, a lot of progress in new technologies. And for example, if you visit the French pavilion, the first example is uh, smart concrete. And uh, what is a smart concrete? Uh, in this concrete, we pour um, chips, so after the, the concrete can communicate. And I think it's very important for the future because a building, a smart building, is a building we, which is uh, able to communicate. And of course, it's also a solution for transportation because uh, we know that uh, new vehicles without driver, when uh, they need to, they can, they can uh, um, uh, they can um, move uh, only with uh, uh, these data um, given by the smart concrete. Uh, this is the first example. The second example is, um, I'm, I'm sorry about my terrible French accent, but uh, uh, the second example is um, solar concrete. In this concrete, we, we put uh, photovoltaic cells, and after all the envelope of the building 
can produce energy. And I think it's, uh, so the performance of that kind of technology is not so good as uh, uh, traditional uh, solar uh, uh, panel. But I think it's not bad because all the envelope of the building is producing energy. The third example, the third example I would like to give you is um, green walls. Uh, we know with the climate change, uh, the cities of the future have to be green. And uh, in these uh, green walls, we use the concrete to put vegetation on these walls. It's like in the nature. In the nature, we know that uh, minerals support vegetation. And the cities of the future, concrete, will support uh, vegetation. And of course, that kind of technology is not so easy because you have to, to manage the supply of water. And uh, that means we need to use uh, uh, data for that. The third example I would like to give you is our uh, translucent concrete. With this concrete, the light can go through. It's not glass, it's concrete, but uh, it's interesting because uh, it's a structural concrete. It can be used in the construction. And if you uh, uh, visit uh, the French pavilion, we, you will be astonished by, uh, by that kind of technology. So with uh, this example, I want to tell you we have solutions for the smart cities. But I think the first thing is to have kind of solution. And of course, all that kind of solution are made with uh, low carbon cement. We know that the cement is um, very, as a, a print, a carbon print, an important pr carbon print. But in the future, the new cement will be low carbon. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now connected with, uh, with Mr. Nicholas Yu. Um, you'll see him at the screen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Nicholas Yu, for joining our panel about smart cities. Uh, I would like to start inviting you to share your thoughts about the role of technology in making our cities better for people. Thank you very much and my apologies for joining you late. Uh, for some reason my Skype uh, decided to upgrade itself this morning without my permission. Uh, I think uh, this is part of the challenge that we have with technology. Uh, I believe that technology can play a very, very significant role in uh, greening our lifestyles and uh, greening our cities. There is no doubt about it. And I think that technology, uh, especially innovation being brought about by technology, will accelerate in the coming decade uh, much quicker than um, we can even imagine today. Uh, but just a word of caution, two words of caution. Uh, first of all, let me give you one example. We, had, um, we have currently a few cities in Europe today um, that are importing garbage. And the reason they are importing garbage is because they chose a technology some 10, 15 years ago um, that was based on burning garbage, not only to dispose of the garbage, but to generate district heating. So all of these cities are, of course, in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. What has happened in the interim period of uh, 10, 15 years is that policies have become very effective in these cities um, to encourage people to recycle, reuse, and reduce the amount of garbage they are generating. And this is particularly the case with uh, two very advanced cities, Stockholm and Vienna, 
who today do not generate enough of their own waste to produce the heat that they require to heat their buildings in their city. So both these cities today are inputting their garbage. So what, um, what do I wish to imply by the, that is that what we have to be very careful going forward is that the evolution of technology and the evolution of society is such that it is becoming increasingly unpredictable. And uh, my, my word of caution is do not lock yourself in to a solution that will require 20, 30, or 40 years in order to amortize itself. This could be a trap. Also, do not think that technology can resolve everything. Um, there are certain issues that have to be sorted out in parallel to the application of new technologies, especially digital technologies. And I will come back to that later, but basically, we have to know why exactly are we using the technology and for what purpose? Is it just to be fashionable, to have a digital building, for example, or even a digital neighborhood? I would argue that today, if we digitize a building um, with the existing technology, you would most probably be building in obsolescence into that building the day that technology changes. So these are some of the issues that we still have to um, come to grips with when it comes to the application of technology and especially innovative technology, disruptive technology. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, well, I would like to start, uh, please. Okay, sorry. Um, if you allow me, I would like to start with two questions, quick questions, and then we'll share questions. Uh, the first one is addressed to uh, Mr. Andrew uh, Snow White. You said you enjoyed global uh, events like uh, the uh, uh, Universal Expo. Uh, can you tell us in which ways, and I find this attitude very interesting, but practically speaking, in which ways do they impact, uh, I mean, the, the, any change? So I think I'd, I'll probably answer that first from a normal citizen's perspective. So I think the thing that, that I found um, one of the most rewarding things I found about doing these two expos is the fact that we're able to have a, a direct conversation with, with citizens, with families, with, with young, old, everybody. Um, and, and that's pretty unique, at least from a, a country's perspective, I guess. So the fact that we can, this summer, share a piece of Americana um, with half a million people, it, it's really rare to be able to do that, especially in an area of the world that um, may not be that familiar with Americans. Um, or maybe it's through kind of mass media, which isn't necessarily always the, the real America. Um, so one of the programs that we've had in both of the expos was to have uh, these people we call student ambassadors, which are um, some of which are here today with us, um, but they're, they're 40, this time 40 university-aged Americans that speak English, they speak Russian, they speak a little Kazakh as well. So it, it's very rare to have an event where we can have this many people uh, in, a, in an area like Kazakhstan be able to have a, a direct interaction with an actual American that can speak with them in their native tongue. And that has a really strong impact on those people. So is that going to affect a piece of legislation overnight? No. But is that going to, over years and decades, inform how people look at not only America, but look at the rest of the world? A absolutely. And I think that that's um, one of the, the things that really excites me. So whether it's the, the US pavilion or the French pavilion um, or, or any pavilion, uh, people have the opportunity to expand their global view 
and to actually meet people. I think that's what somebody mentioned earlier. Um, you know, it's, it's always nice to consume things through some sort of media, but there's nothing like getting out there and actually having, touching something or, or talking to somebody. So from my perspective, that's, um, that, that's a piece that, that's exciting to me because in our, in our digital world, um, there's very few opportunities to have this much, m much reach to such a global audience and global content. Thank you, and, and, and speaking of people brings my second question to all three of you actually, with Mr. Yu too. And um, my question is, is, you know, about people precisely. And um, practically speaking, you know, the, the, the second half of the 20th century was building cities around businesses. How to make a city more, you know, well, having into business, businesses and to make it easier for corporations, etc. So we forgot the human part and the living, the part of the living, not just humans. So in, in which ways, my question is, you know, referring to what Mr. Yu was saying about the fashionable side of technology. What are we talking about? I'm thinking about Paris, for example, who's giving back Paris to uh, citizens. And um, in a way, it's antagonistic with, with the previous uh, policy, w which would turn around, you know, businesses and corporations and make it easier to make money and etc. So how, w what does it mean to give back cities to people and how do smart cities uh, to the living, I, mean, I don't just mean humans, you know, in which ways does it bring life back to, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, to countries and cities? Yes, it works now. Thank you. Um, I think the question of nowadays is how we can cooperate much better between the governance of the cities, between the non-profit organizations, and between um, the private sector. Um, it is a question that, uh, for example, um, the private sectors, uh, we have the research centers, and um, we can find, we, we, can, uh, we have uh, many innovations. But the question it is to find the appropriate innovation to the problem of the city of the future. And the question is how we can, uh, we can uh, share uh, that kind of problematic. So that's why I think um, the World Expo, International Expo, are very important uh, to share that kind uh, of problems. Uh, I was uh, last week in, uh, in France, we, have, uh, we had a meeting uh, with uh, some uh, uh, mayors of big cities in France, and uh, they, they are convinced it's important uh, to introduce innovations in our um, purchasing. But how to do it? if we don't know uh, the quality of the innovation. And so that's why uh, it's important to, to have uh, um, maybe uh, some meetings, maybe some with uh, internet and so on, some, some um, place where it's possible to share uh, the point of view between the government, governance of the cities, between the private sector, and of course also with uh, inhabitants of the cities. I think, for example, when we speak about smart cities, uh, I think in a lot of countries, the question is not a problem of smart cities. The first problem is a problem of safe cities. We have, uh, for example, uh, last week, the, the sad example of what happens in the USA with the floodings in Texas. And we know with the, change clim the ch climate change, we will face with a lot, of kind, uh, a lot of problems like that. How can we organize the cities of the future to be more safe? We have also the problem of terrorism. For example, in, uh, in Berlin, I, I read the, in the, the newspapers that uh, they are going to, to manage uh, 
face recognition cameras. So maybe in the future, uh, we have to accept uh, to have more safe cities, to have more uh, uh, data about our lives. That's the point of view. I'll, I'll comment on that from a new, new city and new smart city perspective. I think the most challenging thing, there, there's a lot of challenges that go into building a new city. I mean, it's a really complex concept. Um, but probably the most difficult is how do you create a soul for your city? How do you develop a space that's going to have a heartbeat, that is going to be a place that people are going to want to live and want to work and, and want to recreate, feel safe, um, feel connected. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that a lot of the new cities face. And you hear these stories about ghost cities and so forth where um, there may be a government or a developer that, that in their mind thinks, well, this is, this is the type of city we need. And at the end of the day, it's still about people and it's about people's needs and, and where do they want to live and what do they, where do they want to work and where do they want to recreate. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest challenge in terms of the, the, the human aspect, and it, it can be done, um, but it's, it's hard and it takes some, some time. Thank you. Vivian, you have questions, I believe. Yes, I, I think I would like to invite Nicholas. Nicholas, are you there? He's not there? I'm here. Okay, thank you. So, Nicholas, um, I would like uh, your point of view, to, to know your point of view about the biggest challenges that cities have to face uh, worldwide concerning, um, concerning technology, I'm sorry, uh, concerning sustainable projects. Okay, I think there are, uh, there are several challenges. The first challenge I believe is how do we actually design sustainability. Until now, most of the approaches that we have used are, have been sectoral. So we see a lot of uh, uh, new technology applications that are trying to invest to transport energy, water, um, etc. But we still have the point of uh, a system I think this is a very good challenge. We cannot be without that And you most probably won't have a good And all of these things are being linked. And they will become more so. But for the moment, existing technologies and the technologies seem on Earth are still a member of governments, which are sectoral, and second of all, uh, very much separated by the graphic or jurisdiction. So for me, one of the challenges going forward is how do we adopt uh, a, an approach that can fit for this sector and an approach to override the uh, often politically driven agendas of different geographic jurisdictions. And this is not an easy task. It will require a lot of political courage, political will, to be able to overcome the uh, jurisdictional problems that it will also take a lot of technologies in order to reach the different climate. Uh, I have a question, if you allow me, for Mr. Yu, about the role of transnational. Are, are you still, is he still with us? Yes, I am. I just turned Oh, okay, because I've lost your... Uh, your, your visual. Uh, my question is about the role you know, of transnational institutions from, I mean, your experience. Um, what, what is the exact role of transnational institutions like the organizations like the UN and, and how would you assess their impact and influence on, on change and 
uh, are you satisfied with the results that you got, that you got and that you're bound to get I mean these institutions are bound to get in not just the areas of smart cities but any any policies that you propose or uh, any resolutions that you take etc international organizations um, have been uh, undergoing a rapid change in, with respect to their role and their responsibilities. Without a doubt, after the Second World War, led by the uh, World Bank and other institutions, a lot of these transnational institutions were actually engaged in physical development work on the ground. Um, this was perhaps born out of necessity. What has happened over the last two decades or so is that these institutions are much more focused on policy. And I think they uh, bring to the table one unique trait, which was mentioned by a frequent speaker of the role of the Expo, is that uh, they provide a space for dialogue, for policy dialogue, be it at the local, national, or regional, or international level. I think this is increasingly relevant. Um, we, countries cannot solve, cities, first of all, cannot solve sustainability issues on their own. That is without a question. The, uh, the water knows no boundaries, uh, energy knows no boundaries, pollution knows no boundaries. And storms certainly have no national boundaries. So the sustainable city of the future will be a connected city, a city that is connected with the other cities in uh, an unbroken cycle of learning, of exchange, of experience and expertise. Uh, how is that going to fit with uh, nation states that oftentimes are certain other of or cooperation and collaboration? So I think these transnational organizations fill a very important role and is to bring different stakeholders, different cities around the same table to discuss common which know no boundary. So I think in the future we will have to multiply even more these things in order to have almost quasi-permanent between stakeholders and between countries. Thank you. So, Pierre, um, you mentioned the collaboration between governments and companies uh, for people, and including people's um, needs. What I would like to ask you is how engaged you think the private sector is with governments on creating um, well, smarter cities, and looking beyond the profit opportunity. So what should be they looking at before, beyond uh, profit? I think um, the problem for the smart cities, if you have the point of view of the citizen, the question is, uh, um, we have to organize the city to give uh, all the services to the citizens in 15 minutes. So, uh, because we have to, to, to decrease the time on, of, on, of transportation, that's very important. We have to, to give all the solutions for uh, food, uh, everything. And at the same time, at the government level, we have to plan the city maybe for 50 years. How the city will be in 15 years? 50 years. So we have to manage the two, uh, the two level of time. And I think um, in France, for example, we have a lot of clusters. And these clusters gathered um, private sector, schools, universities, and um, government uh, um, people of, uh, also. 
So this is, a, I think this is a good way to improve uh, the way of conception of the cities of the future. And the second thing, I think, is we have not only one way to build the smart cities. It depends on the history of each city, and uh, all the problems are different. Uh, if, for example, you are in the south of France, in Marseille, for example, or if you are in Paris. So we have to think with um, cultural heritage of the cities to think the smart city of the future. And of course, we are not going to organize the city, for example, in China, in Africa, or in Europe. It's not the, the same way. The climate is different. And we also have to take uh, that, that kind of uh, problem in our mind when we think the, the, the city of the future. But I think the first, the very important thing now, of course, very often you, we speak about the two degrees, three degrees more temperature of the climate. But I think now is to think, to organize a city with a higher temperature. And that means we have to think different. We have to, you, you can't live in a city like Paris like you live in the cities in Africa because the climate is different. But Paris has to, to change because uh, the city is organized for uh, a, a, that kind of climate, temperate, and in the future, it will be, the temperature will be higher. How can we organize this transformation? That is the question. Uh, Andrew, I would like to invite you to showcase uh, some of the innovative initiatives that you're, you're exposing on, exhibiting on the USA Pavilion. Well, first I want to, I want to follow up because I think you made a really important point, which is what is a smart city? You know, smart city is going to be very different um, depending on where in the world you are and whether you're talking about a city that's been around for a thousand years or 300 years or a city you're planning that day. Um, so, you know, it's hard when we use these big kind of terms like smart city without really then defining it down to a, a more localized level. So I think that was a, that was a really important point. Um, you know, I think that if you come and visit, which I think a lot of us will come and visit tomorrow, you're going to see that our focus in the pavilion is, is very much on a people-to-people -people perspective both in terms of the similarities between um, the human energy of Americans and the human energy of, of, of people in Kazakhstan. Um, what's, what's pretty interesting about uh, the pavilion for us is that we don't receive any federal funding for the U.S. pavilion. Um, there's a law in America that says that it, that it requires an act of, of Congress to provide federal funds. So all of our, sponsor, or all of our money actually comes from, from the private sector. Um, so what we've done is I think we have a nice balance of, of kind of the fun, um, kind of high energy entertainment type of story in our pavilion, but then also we have um, a number of technologies that are being exhibited by some of our partners like General Electric. So for example, um, they have a lot of, uh, you know, are, are very heavy into the renewable uh, sector in terms of things like wind turbines, um, but they also have um, a, uh, a, 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 a kind of next generation locomotive plant here in Astana. So we touch on some of those, those points as well. Um, you know, I think, you know, as Nicholas pointed out, the, 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 the challenge and the opportunity is there's so much technology out there. Um, the things that excite me are to hear about when we have core elements to, to infrastructure and building like concrete and we can start integrating things like uh, photovoltaics into them, that's what excites me because you have this ability to have a, a, a massive, truly massive um, paradigm shift in, in the way that, that infrastructure is built. Um, so I think the, the challenge is that, you know, the challenge is there's so many, so many technologies out there, um, you know, it's also the opportunity, there's so many technologies out there, but as Nicholas said, how do you pick them and how do you make sure that within, you know, the next week they're not already going to be out, outdated? So um, I think 
it requires a level of risk in people trying some new things to see, see what might work. And I think that gets back to your, your question also about the private sector is um, you need private sector partners that are willing to do some R&D and to try some new things out that are going to be part of this larger holistic um, um, in, in, you know, environment that will then go back and, and, and benefit the public sector and the government and, and citizens. Uh, and you're, well, since you've been participating of several expos, how do you evaluate the evolution of the, the private sector embracing the, you know, topics like? Yeah, it's, I mean, what I found is that it's, it's relatively localized in terms of, so just speaking from the, the U.S. Pavilion's perspective, and, and Pierre might be able to speak from the French perspective, but um, for us, when we go out to the private sector to support one of these um, types of projects, you have to go to the, the corporations that are most active in whatever that, that location might be. So um, for the last, for both the Yosu Expo and, and for here, uh, Chevron uh, was, was one of our largest sponsors. So um, they have their largest uh, uh, project in the world here is a Tengiz oil field out in the West. Um, and in Yosu, they, uh, they, they had a very large refinery. Um, so that also presents an interesting, you know, balance depending on the types of stories that we want to tell as well. But they've been extremely supportive of, um, y you know, for America, uh, it's really critical that w what we've seen is that from a bilateral relationship perspective, you know, talking about actual country to country relationships, it's really important that America is there if America's there, then it benefits the, the private sector. And then obviously there's the whole public diplomacy piece as well. Um, so we have sponsors like, um, you know, G and Chevron are our two largest. Um, we also have sponsors like, like Citibank, who, um, you know, in America is doing all sorts of amazing things. I mean, they have a whole smart city um, initiative in America, but here they're also one of, if not the only foreign banks and are doing um, a lot of the banking for the, the, the multinationals. Um, so it's, it's, it's an iterative process. Um, you know, the next, the next uh, expo is in Dubai, and um, that's going to be a much, a much heavier lift because, you know, as, as those who, who are not familiar, um, this is a three-month expo. The next World Expo is in Dubai, which is six months long, and you have to, for at least a country the size of America, you have to physically build a, a building. So you're talking about um, a really significant amount of money. Um, but it's all about what's the narrative of that specific location and who are the, the companies that are going to be willing to step up to, um, you know, not only fulfill their goals, but to fulfill the U.S. government's goals and, and the goals of the bilateral, bilateral relationship. Uh, I have um, my question is go by twos. My first question is about construction. We're 7.5 billion people on this planet now, and in 15 years from now, we'll be like 9, 9 billion. Where do we get all that cement from? Is it, I mean, are there any other ways of construction that we can think about or think of? What's going to happen? How do you see the future of construction not just in terms of smart cities, but in practical terms, what are we going to be building with? You know, stone is not something that is, uh, it's a perishable thing, isn't it? I know the, the needs uh, will be huge for, because we know, you said, uh, 9 billion people. Uh, and it means uh, most of these people will be live in cities. Um, of course, the planet has enough, uh, enough stones, enough materials um, to, to build housing. But the question in the future, we have to think how to reuse the materials we used in the past to build cities. And uh, we call uh, we call that kind of practice circular economy. And I think it's, uh, it's a very, for the future, it can be um, very interesting. But for example, uh, if I take um, 
the, in France, we are, we are working of, of that point of view. We, we know we need uh, aggregates, a lot of aggregates. The question is how to use old aggregates, old concrete, to make new concrete. And now, with the new technologies, it's possible. But it doesn't go enough um, fast as it, uh, we, we need. Uh, for example, I will give you some, uh, some examples. In Lyon, we know if we only want to use, uh, reuse materials for the needs of new construction, it means, it means we have to, dress to, to destroy one third of the city each year. It's impossible. So we need to use natural uh, materials. But I'm, I'm confident of our capacity to, to have the best reuse of the, of the materials. Thank you. My, my second question is about the, the, the private sector specifically. And, um, you know, it's about finding room for optimism. Uh, because looking at what's happening now, you know, I, I, I find there are serious concerns about the uh, responsibility of governments, especially the U.S. government, when you see that they're withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. So, but the, the room for optimism is that the private sector is not following this, is not following suit. There's an opposition between what the government, the new government wants, or there seems to be, and what the private sector is doing. They're opposing this evolution and they're strongly supporting the Paris Agreement. So what is, the, how, how do you see the future of the pressure that the private sector and, you know, the citizens, the civil society can have on the risk of going backwards or diversions and, you know, the, the serious concerns that we might have about this. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm putting on my personal hat for this one. Um, I think getting back to one of the comments earlier about the private sector in, in cities and, and the private sector only be dri being driven by profit, I think at the end of the day we kind of all have to acknowledge that private sector is typically driven by profit. Um, but, but what I'm optimistic about is that the private sector is starting to see that they can make money by doing the right thing. And I think that some of the, the policies, uh, especially in America right now, are, um, I think, being driven in a manner that um, is appeasing certain groups. However, I think that the, the, the private sector is seeing a much greater opportunity in the short and long term for new technologies, which in a lot of cases are the clean, renewable, efficient technologies. And I think that that is going to end up, um, I want to use a word, but I'm not going to. You can probably all guess what it is. I think that's going to end up um, taking a step above what, what the political climate's doing, what the, the policies are doing, and, and, and implementing um, these things on their own. I mean, even in the states, we have certain, certain um, states that are, that are saying, all right, you know, the federal government might be going in one direction, but we're going to enact our own policies on a local level. Um, but, but, you know, in America, like it or not, you know, the almighty dollar um, typically drives uh, a lot of decisions, and even if the, the government policy is going one way, but if, if the profits in another direction, and the way I think we're seeing it is that from a large scale where jobs and, and long-term growth goes is, is in this efficient manner, that's, that's where it's going to go. So I think that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I was trying to be somewhat diplomatic while wearing a few hats here. I think it's uh, also important to remember that many cities are standing for the Paris Agreement in America. So it's, it's, it's of course, there is the federal government, but cities themselves, they are standing for the agreement and, you know, supporting. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you mentioned the, the, the tragic floods that have happened in Houston. Um, you know, I think there's going to be some soul searching that's going to go on in America and, and 
what's really scary is there's another very large hurricane um, that's going to hit the states in the next few days. Um, you know, hopefully that can change course, but right now it looks like it's going to go somewhere in Florida into the Gulf of Mexico, which could be pretty catastrophic if it if it came back to, to Houston. Um, but Houston's going to be a pretty interesting case study because, you know, in the spirit of that part of America, um, you know, regulation was not always uh, something that was that was put on the on the top of the priority list. And I think this is a really good example, unfortunately, of when you don't have certain levels of regulation and you don't have certain uh, types of planning, um, as we see these larger and uh, more intense weather events and natural disasters occurring, they're going to have a more significant impact than they may have had in the past. So, um, you know, I, I'm hopeful that this will again be a, a lesson that both governments learn, that, that the municipalities will learn in America, but also that the private sector will see um, how they have to, to plan in the future because at the end of the day, you know, it's not just a question of profit, it's a question of risk management. And, um, and, and I think that the risk managers in, in these corporations are also realizing that, uh, you know, they've got to be realistic about the changing world that we live in. Uh, actually, I have a question for Ms. K Mr. Yu. Is this still with us? Mr. Yu, are you, is Mr. Yu still with us? Yes, you're here. Okay. Um, um, this is not exactly about, uh, specifically about smart cities, but about habitat. And um, there's one, the, there's, you know, the, the, but I would like to hear something about the homeless. Uh, you know, their number is growing exponentially in all the big cities. Uh, what is, do you have any, uh, any view on, I mean, about any idea of how this is going to be evolved and which direction this is going to evolve and is there any policy, whether transnational or governmental, that is going to take into account the growing number of homeless people and, uh, you know, how is it to be handled, this, um, this crucial um, issue? so-called informal settlements. Indeed, the number is growing. And uh, although we do see some signs that in percentage-wise, uh, the proportion of people living in slums and informal settlements is not increasing as rapidly as before. Uh, but in absolute terms, the number is rising. And I think this is part of the reason why uh, the international community uh, adopted, uh, first of all, the Sustainable Development Goals, and then uh, shortly thereafter, the New Urban Agenda. Uh, I think there is no doubt in many people's minds that a smart and sustainable city in the future will have to be an inclusive one. We cannot leave people out. We cannot leave people behind. Uh, even if technology and private sector and uh, people are making uh, cities great again because they want to live in cities rather than in suburbia, uh, we are faced with the challenge that um, cities tend, have tended in the last decade or so to become more exclusionary. So definitely we're seeing on the horizon are both cities and nation states that are quite preoccupied with this trend. Uh, let's take rates, the global cities of this world, like New York, Paris, and London. Uh, when we when I speak with those players, number two issue is housing. Basically what we're facing is a crunch, a crunch between a city that uh, people who are talking to cities, people who want to live in cities, people who want to work and trade in cities, but at the same time 
put a lot of pressure on the housing market, and it is this pressure leaving people behind. So uh, we have to come up with comprehensive policies. You, you cannot solve. Agenda have absolutely right in um, stressing that we must leave no one behind. Thank you. I think it's, um, I would like to broaden the question a little bit um, because when we talk about homelessness, we, we talk about uh, vulnerable people. And one of the most vulnerable population, they are in coastal regions. So you, you can also add some comments uh, before or uh, after. But uh, I would like to, to, to know what is your point of view about how smart cities technologies can help, can help people uh, living in coastal regions, like vulnerable populations living in coastal regions. We lost him. Your question is, is for Mr. Yu. Both. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> well, surprisingly, the, the cities that have been uh, hit recently by massive power burdens uh, and are taking action in order to prevent flooding to happen again on a massive scale are uh, first and foremost going back to a very old technology, which is implant. Uh, disasters like used to have happened is because we've uh, been totally in the way we have allowed communities to occupy land. I think the first thing that uh, many cities have realized in recent times is that they will have to revisit the land use. And they will have to allow uh, uh, natural floodgates to do their work. But at the same time, we're beginning to see a very interesting achievement on the urban planning, urban design. I would take the case of the Copenhagen. Uh, many of you may recall that Copenhagen also witnessed the very simple flooding years ago which led them to uh, completely rethink how they could and happen again. And uh, what's happening in COVID is that they are, for example, redefining what its public place is. For so almost every single park, every single park, every single playground, basketball court, tennis court, redesigned as a protect a water retention area. Even parking, public parking and physical parking structures are being redesigned to retain and to release that water over much longer period of time as to not just affect uh, flooding. This has become extremely exciting because we are safe at the same time that we are seeing technologies uh, will allow you to predict uh, perhaps what is going to happen and technologies that will you hope with disaster once it happens. We are beginning to see a combination of uh, or re emergence of good earth planning and good earth design. That uh, perhaps the lack of which was at the origin of the problem. So, um, Copenhagen is one example, but we're seeing this also happen with New York after Storm Sandy. And how they are redefining how they're going to use the waterfront. And all of this is, I find, very exciting because it is bringing together uh, a qualitative aspect together with a technological. So, how do we make use of the technology, but also how do we make it intelligently? We create multi-purpose spaces that are um, 
are capable of coping with this problem. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think as Nicholas was, was noting, it's, you know, you have to start from a land planning perspective and you have to, um, you know, use science. The, the developers and the, and the municipalities have got to use the data that's now available. You know, there's really wonderful simulation tools uh, that, that you can use and, and start to determine, you know, what your, um, you know, if, if everything stays it is, as it is and, and you kind of have this, the, the certain number of storms or floods or whatever every 1,500 so years, you can plan for that. But you also now can start simulating, okay, what if there's two degree change? What if there's a four degree change? What if there's a six degree change? You know, how are those things going to affect um, a place? So I think there's that, that science piece which has got to drive um, both policy as well as the private sector decisions. Um, I think we have to get back to some of the, the natural processes too, you know, the, 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 the ecosystem science. Um, you, you know, in places like New Orleans with Katrina, there was a lot of unnatural things done to the, the environment. You know, that's, a, that's an area of the world that for millennia did pretty well on its own, was able to absorb the storms because of the, the, the plants and, and um, wetlands and so forth. And, and we have to acknowledge when we destroy those things, then, then it's going to have a massive effect on, on um, how we, we deal with storms. So I think it's both a, depending on where the coast is, you have to have to look at both sea level rise, but also, you know, rain and water coming, coming from a downflow. Um, I, it's going back to your question too, in regard to the coastal cities, and, and I think this is just something in general, and I, I can't, it's hard for me to not talk about this whenever I talk about cities and urbanization. Um, is the focus on young people and especially um, girls. And I think that's a level of equality and empowerment so that um, there is an opportunity for people to be a productive member of society. And, and I think that that um, is something that relates to safety, as we talked about earlier. It's something that relates to, um, to opportunity and, um, and as Nicholas was, was talking about as well, you know, um, you know, equality within, within the cities themselves and, and getting it, everybody at an actual chance. Um, and I think we're seeing that people are flocking towards these, these coastal areas. Um, and when you talk about, you know, all of these things, homelessness, everything, I think, uh, you know, young people and especially girls are, are a key piece of the puzzle, uh, even when we talk about smart cities. So I think that's, from an education and everything else perspective, it's something I always kind of like to throw in there. Uh, I'm curious, why why girls? Can you? I mean, why why girls? I think, you know, the studies show that if girls are not given an opportunity to learn, if um, you know, when they get to a certain point of of their life, there's certain cultures where they're no longer able to go to school, or there's certain times. Um, uh, of, of the month that they're not allowed to attend school and, and it's also sometimes can be unsafe as we talked about too, trying to get to school and so forth. So by, by taking a, a huge portion of society out of the, the mix, so to say, in terms of an opportunity to be a truly productive uh, member, um, it has negative if not catastrophic effects. So I think that's, you know, for me, sustainability, smart cities, it's, it's always about people. And if you don't have um, the people engaged in, in, in living up to their potential, it's hard for that city to maximize itself as well. Okay. Yes, one, one final question on my part. Um, this question for Mr. Boyer. Um, we've talked about private sector and governments and people in general. But if we look at civil society and the active and activist sides of civil society, they're suspicious, you know, how, how, how to bring back, my question is about bringing back trust between corporations and civil society. You've been talking about your company, your corporation, and your views and vision of a world that is inclusive and cities that are 
uh, sustainable, etc. Uh, the civil society is skeptical about both capacity and will of corporations to go in that direction. What's your answer? How, how, how would you build or reinstate trust? Um, the question of the trust is a very uh, good question. Um, we know in the world that when we have a, a new project, immediately you have people against, especially in France. And uh, I think um, the solution, um, we have to communicate much better about what we want to do before we do it. And we have to train people. We have to invest in the education of the people. To, um, people have to understand what are the, um, the issues and what kind of solutions we can, uh, we can plan to, to solve them. And the question of technologies is not uh, only a question of technologies. I think it's much more a question of uh, education, a question of training to use the, these uh, technologies to solve the problem. Uh, if we don't invest in education, I think we, we are going to miss all the, we are going to, uh, the money is, uh, is lost. It's lost. Uh, education for me is very important. So that's why I think in the companies, uh, you, you, you can see like a lot of big companies use uh, how to train their customers to use their technologies. And that is the same things for us uh, in the construction area. If we want to, to have the smart cities, we have to educate people how to live in a smart city. If not, it doesn't work. And um, you, you spoke about the homeless people. I think, uh, of course, we have to, to give them uh, housing, food, and so on, but we also have to give them education. If not, uh, we are on the wrong way. And the, the other thing I want to say about the private sector, private sector is, as you have many differences in the private sector, but as I think the private se sector, we want to have, um, we want to, ma to make money, but in the long term. And if our solutions doesn't, wo doesn't uh, work for the long term, uh, we are out of the market. So, uh, we have to understand as well as possible what are the, the needs of the population, the needs of the cities, the needs of the citizen. Uh, I think this, uh, oh, there is no other solution to, to go on. Thank and you. Also because people, people are afraid of the new. People are normally afraid of technology. So you have to explain then yeah. how, how it works to make it happen, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to start an exercise here. We, well, the UN SDGs, they, they, they work with the frame, the 2030 framework. Uh, how do you see the world in 2030? It's, it's here, right? It's 13, year, thir 13 years from now, so please. <laughs> All the three. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a, a tough question. I think, um, I think we're going to see an exponential increase in, in technologies and um, applications of those technologies. I think the question is, can civil society and government catch up with them? So the optimistic side of me says yes, and, and hopefully some of these technologies are going to help to um, solve the, the challenges that the world's facing. I think, you know, there's a lot of kind of unrest in the world right now, and, and I think we're facing a number of, of geopolitical challenges that are going to affect things um, over the next 13 years. So I am, I'm hopeful that there's, there's peaceful resolutions to all of those things, and that we're able to um, embrace technology in a, in a positive manner and that uh, that technology is embraced um, I think kind of for the people and by the people um, 
So I, I think the tools are there, and I, uh, I think there's a lot of challenges, but I think that, that I'm hopeful that people will embrace them in the right way, and we're going to be in a better place 13 years from now than we are today. I, I'm uh, optimistic for the, the future. I think um, uh, in the future, the power will be more in the cities than in the states. Uh, because um, we see that, uh, for example, for the economic growth, the growth nowadays are, is in the city, it's not uh, in, the, in the country. And the second thing, uh, of course, the planet uh, will be different with the climate change, but um, I think we'll uh, succeed to adapt our way of life to this change. I think the, the government of the planet uh, will be better because um, I think with, uh, you, you spoke about the activists, we have this pressure to to, to go on, on this way, to have a, a better planet uh, uh, guide, guide, guidelines for how to, to live, how to work. Um, and uh, there is another thema we didn't uh, speak, it's about uh, biodiversity. And that is a, a huge challenge for the future. We have to go on positive biodiversity. And the smart cities will integrate this aspect of the life because we know the humankind is an element of the global biodiversity. And uh, I think we will have uh, progress uh, in this matter. Nicholas. Yeah, Nicholas Hugh? Yes. Can you share your thoughts about how do you see the future, the near future? Uh, I must also share a reasonable amount of optimism with uh, my co-panelists. I think uh, part of the optimism is rooted in the fact that the uh, uh, international community has recognized the importance of urbanization finally. After three major UN conferences, uh, finally last year it began to realize that um, uh, even though cities may only occupy two or three percent of our land, uh, they may only harbor for the moment only slightly above 50 percent of the world's population, uh, the, they do, the cities do generate somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of all emissions, be that greenhouse gas emissions and other forms of waste. So I think uh, there is a realization that we have, have to tackle the bull by the horns. Uh, I would like to hope that uh, in the next uh, very short period of time, in the next year or so, uh, with momentum building up on how we're going to implement the Sustainable Development Goals and the New Urban Agenda, that we will give the right amount of power to cities in order to tackle these challenges. Because these issues, 60 or 70%, of the global challenges and the global goals that we have set for ourselves, that all nation states have agreed to, or perhaps one, um, is that we, uh, we have to tackle these at the local level. There is no one size fit all solution. This is what's really exciting, is that if we are serious about tackling climate change, if we're serious about tackling what Jonathan just mentioned, preserving and even restoring our biodiversity, these solutions will have to be local, they will have to be unique, they will demand a tremendous amount of innovation and creativity. So this is perhaps the, to join our private sector friend, I'd like to say that uh, going green, going sustainable for our cities um, could, if we have the right mix of policies, partnerships, and governance models really uh, give true meaning to the word or the concept of the green economy. Because then that's when technologies, people, and governance systems can mesh and really come up with 
really uh, innovative and original solutions, uh, disruptive in the positive way. Um, I would like to know your point of view, particularly about um, developing countries. How do you see the evolution of um, smart cities projects in developing countries? Well, I would like to just mention that um, let's not underestimate the, uh, the uh, smart applications that are coming out of developing countries. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, just remind everybody that the first mobile phone financial transaction system in the world was invented in Kenya. It's called M-Pesa. Uh, it had one incredible impact, was that until M-Pesa was established in Kenya, uh, about 40% of the population was excluded from banking, basically because if you don't have a minimum amount of capital or if you don't have a fixed job, if you're living in a slum without a fixed address or a recognized address, you cannot open up a bank account anywhere in the world. So M-Pesa empowered 40% of the people in Kenya who could not access financial institutions, did not have a safe place to put their savings or could not borrow against those savings. That was a major breakthrough. Uh, I have been a frequent visitor of Chinese cities. I advise several of them. In the last year or so, we've seen an explosion of applications out of uh, cities in China on the sharing economy. Some of them quite surprising. Some of them totally unexpected. But uh, here again, this is where the combination of technology, especially communication technology, uh, big data analytics, etc., is allowing new business models to emerge very, very quickly. And I think uh, so for, for in developing countries, we have a case where we could actually leapfrog uh, several generations of technological applications. It's already evident with the mobile phone. We, mobile phone penetration in developing countries is very high and uh, allowed several countries to skip completely the uh, wire technology, um, and I think this will continue in the future. We recently had a uh, webinar on how technologies and applications are making a real impact in the developing world, and I think there again we are seeing some very positive developments. Thank you. Um, I'm done. <clears throat> Uh, since we, we didn't have the keynote uh, speakers at the beginning, I would like um, to invite Nicholas Yu to wrap up <laughs> and to make some, some final comments. So take your time, uh, please share with us what you prepared to, 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 to talk to us. Uh, you mean to, to share with you what the conclusions of my keynote was supposed to Uh, basically, what uh, I wanted to focus on in my presentation on smart and sustainable cities was uh, what are some of the lessons that we can learn uh, from recent experiences. We talk about big data, we talk about technology, we talk about new business models, um, and we talk about new forms of partnerships, uh, be that PPP and new forms of government. So basically what I've done is look at a few examples, and I will go through them quite quickly, um, if you allow me. Well, we talked about the issue of safety. Um, I came across a, a very exciting uh, case in Rio de Janeiro a few years ago. What had happened in Rio was something that we are beginning to see everywhere around the world. There was a cloudburst. And uh, what happened was in Rio de Janeiro, because of the configuration of the city and because where, the, where people, rich and poor people live, well, what happened is that that cloud burst resulted in many deaths and severe landslides that destroyed a lot of property. 
Uh, the then newly elected mayor said, I don't want this ever to happen again on uh, my uh, uh, administration. So he forced all of the, the uh, departments, all of his uh, different sections to work together on finding a comprehensive solution to flooding and landslide. And basically that's how the big data experiment started in Rio de Janeiro. In this massive exercise, they discovered sources of data that they have been collecting and sitting on for decades, but not using. And a very, very simple proposition of, of with soil analytics and maps of where people were living allowed them to come up with the first early warning system of cloud bursts and potential landslides. And indeed, one year later, when the rains came back again, there were no deaths. So here we, get, here we have a perfect example of how data analysis, when it is well focused, when we know why we're collecting the data and for what reason, um, can effectively improve safety. And since then, that uh, basic system has grown and is now being applied, of course, to ensure more efficient transport, energy, water, etc. Another example which I found fascinating is the example of Bristol. And here I visited Bristol several times over the past decade, and I was quite amazed at its transformation. Its transformation has been very, very rapid. Um, I still remember Bristol 20, 25 years ago with a city with many no-go zones, a, a dangerous city to uh, walk around after dark. And uh, basically, uh, the mayor of Bristol, Mayor F Ferguson, uh, decided to come up with a smart and green Bristol. And one of the outstanding features of his approach to the smart city was to empower people, to educate people, as was mentioned previously by one of the panelists, so that they could play a critical role in deciding which technologies they were going to, uh, would like to see applied to their city and for what purpose. So basically what Mayor Ferguson did was undertake a massive civic education exercise, educating people on, first of all, defining for themselves what a smart city is and should be for them, and then what a green city is and should be for them. And what are, how can they make better use of technology to reach that goal? New business models. As I mentioned in Chinese cities today, if anybody's been to any Chinese city recently, they would have witnessed what we call a bug infestation. What they mean by bugs is, of course, bicycles. And what we have seen is an explosion of bike sharing bike sharing that uh, unlike the models that we have prevalent in much of Europe and other countries is completely based on a different business model. It is profit making, even though it's, uh, we're not exactly sure how it makes a profit, but it is because none of these bikes are being subsidized or none of these bike sharing systems are being subsidized by uh, the municipal or the public sector. These are entirely private initiatives, and uh, one of the first cities to have done this was Hangzhou in China, where uh, by placing the bike stations in within 20 to 50 meters of bus and metro stations and combining them with uh, basically convenience stores and telecoms, they were able to close the last mile, basically but what has happened since is that there's been an explosion of other business models in China, which is now also rapidly reaching uh, neighboring countries. So here again, uh, uh, an example of how um, a initiative can be led by the private sector, for-profit sector, and can transform people's lives. Uh, one other example I came across, which I think is extremely relevant. Uh, we spoke about education, but I think another real aspect 
of the smart and sustainable city of the future will be a healthy city. And uh, as many of you know, I live six months a year in Kenya. And uh, one of the biggest problems we have in Kenya is the chain in the healthcare system. So we have low qualified sanitation workers at the local level, and then progressively as you get to the clinics and the hospitals, you have better equipment, better supplies, and better human resources. This has resulted in a lot of misdiagnosis of symptoms. So people come in and they complain of headaches or this ache or that ache or fever, and inevitably the, the medical officer at the very local level always prescribes two things, either aspirin or an anti-malarial pill. And this misdiagnosis has been re really detrimental, not only to health, but also to the uh, years living in Kenya with uh, staff that were working for me or with me, and they would systematically be misdiagnosed until we were able to bring them to uh, better medical care. Now, with uh, the Internet of Things and with information communication technology, we're beginning to see how this can be solved by connecting those remote and very local health units and health centers with the bigger hospitals so that when the medical officer does make a diagnosis, they can check with their peers in the larger centers to see if that di diagnosis is relevant or not and therefore prescribe perhaps a better treatment. Last but not least, um, I think they're uh, coming to the discussion that we had about the private sector. Uh, let me take the example of Guangzhou and the carbon bank in Korea. What happened here was Guangzhou, uh, a very progressive city, decided that it wanted to tackle uh, the climate change challenge, and it wanted to uh, uh, engage its citizens in lowering the carbon footprint of the city. We tried very hard for a number of years, and uh, one of the biggest difficulties it encountered was that uh, the utility firms uh, were not talking to each other. So the breakthrough solution in the case of Guangzhou came with a private bank, with the Guangzhou Bank, which uh, acted as an honest broker between the three utilities, water, uh, energy and gas, and they were able to uh, gain the trust of the three utility companies and to basically do the data analytics and to come up with a carbon point system whereby uh, each resident that consumes uh, these three utilities, each uh, citizen, can see on their monthly bill uh, what saving electricity does to the carbon footprint, what saving water does to the carbon footprint, what saving gas does to the carbon footprint, and they in return get points which are translated into discounts on their future utility bills. This I am uh, happy to share with you. Last year it became nationwide with the federal government stepping in and the ministry stepping in until then, it was uh, basically financed. The carbon point system was financed out of CSR from the private bank. Now it's being financed at the national level. So again, an example of a local, very local solution going to scale, becoming nationwide. And uh, my hope is, of course, that this model will be able to uh, uh, impact also other uh, cities and other utility companies around the world on how they can uh, join forces to help realize both a global goal and to make that global goal meaningful to uh, consumers on when they see that the impact on their monthly bill. In conclusion, what I would like to say, uh, say is that uh, I'm just looking back in time. When we talked about smart cities uh, around 2005, uh, I came up with this composite definition. This is uh, bringing together several definitions and making one composite definition. Uh, basically, in 2005, uh, 
I would say that a smart city was defined as a city that uses information communication technology to enhance its livability, workability, and sustainability. Uh, ten years later, 2015, again looking at the literature, uh, I came up with the following composite definition of what a smart city is. And by 2015, smart and sustainable cities are connected communities, activities, services, systems, and people to improve quality of life and preserve the planet's resources. So basically what we see here, if we just do a simple grammatical analysis, is that the smart city has, in a relatively short space of time, a decade, um, shifted its focus from ICT to people, to people and communities. So uh, what are the lessons that we can learn from this and from the examples that I gave and many others? I think that the future smart and sustainable city is, as was mentioned in the panel, is a city that puts people first. It also puts public sector back in a driving seat. I think this is very important. Uh, companies can come up with solutions. They already have many of the solutions that we need to make our cities uh, smarter, greener, and more sustainable. But how those solutions are going to be used, how are they going to be applied and implemented effectively on the ground, is still very much a public sector decision. And if we're going to have smart cities, we need smart people in government. So we need to make government jobs and employment of choice again. I think the other, the another aspect is that the future smart and sustainable city will push for the highest standards of quality, be that quality in public goods and services, so that we're not just talking about quantity anymore. We're not just talking about how many square meters or linear meters or kilometers of roads and uh, of infrastructure we will be talking about how effective that infrastructure is in helping us avoid things like flooding, disasters, and to enhance safety and security for the citizens. I also think that the future smart and sustainable city is one that engages in continuous learning. It has to become a learning city. One of the things I've noticed in my experience working with cities around the world is that cities do not know what they don't know. You can send your people to conferences, to events. That does not mean that the knowledge they bring back makes its way into the decision-making or the management systems. So the city as a whole has to become a learning organization where information is shared. Right? And I think this is very, very important because the information will need to be shared in real time. And this is, again, where technology can come into play. We cannot no longer wait for quarterly or end of year reports on impact analysis to shape our policies and our strategies. We need information in real time. And, we, and for that to work, we need to use data strategically. Uh, I'm sorry to say that in too many cases I've seen, uh, big data analytics has uh, taken on a life of its own and we're collecting data for God knows what reason, and we're crunching that data for God knows what reason, I think uh, the smart and sustainable city is one that first defines what is or what are the problems that we want to solve, and then goes and collects and analyzes the data accordingly. Um, and then, last but not least, I think uh, a smart and sustainable city is one that engages people, engages people in, at all levels and all walks of life, and I would like to conclude it is a city that recognizes leadership at all levels, be that at the household level, be that at the school level, be that at the community or at the city government level. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank our panelists and Mr. Andrew Snow White, Executive Director, USA Pavilion. Pierre-Olivier Boyer, Director of Strategic Partnerships of Vicat Group. 
Nicholas Yu, co-president of Global Cities Business Alliance. Alliance. <laughs> and Professor Eli Ayub, uh, are you advisor? Ha, ha, ha. 